in our last lecture, we were looking at the various phases of the Holocaust, and I had focused primarily on the identification of uh, European Jews and German Jews. How exactly was it that um, Jews would have been identified? And um, we already had looked at um, the phase of expropriation, deportation, and um, the concentration of uh, the Jewish peoples. And um, today, we in this lecture, we're going to now start exploring the final phase, what becomes known as the final solution, uh, the destruction of the European Jews, the Holocaust. We saw that uh, on September 1st, 1939, um, the Germans invade Poland. Uh, the Germans, uh, the day before the invasion, would have had under their control a population of approximately 330,000 German Jews and um, Sudetenland Jews and Jews from Austria. Uh, but the moment they cross over into Poland, the number, of course, radically changes. In Poland, there are approximately two and a half million Jews that suddenly fall under uh, the Nazi occupation. Uh, German policy uh, in Poland is essentially to focus on the killing of educated Poles, um, doctors, physicians, professors, um, the clergy, anyone who would be able to play a leading role in a kind of maintaining a Polish identity, a uh, Polish culture. It is the intention of um, the Nazis essentially to destroy the Polish population. The Jews in the meantime are uh, being forced into urban ghettos in the major cities. Um, the countryside is um, uh, uh, cleared of Jewish families, and they are all herded into these sealed ghettos where they end up living under um, horrific conditions of deprivation and um, overcrowding. And it um, varies from ghetto to ghetto, as we'll see. Um, everything the, about the Holocaust is going to vary by geography and territory and who might be the local uh, commander. But as I say, the ghettos are essentially sealed. Uh, you would need a pass to leave a ghetto or enter uh, a ghetto. And, and so you have this enforced segregation of the population in, in Poland. Um, overall, between September of 39 and uh, June of 1941, um, the Polish Jewish population although there are certainly fatalities, um, there is um, cases of um, imposed starvation in some of the ghettos, uh, but overall the population remains relatively stable. Approximately um, two million Jews have been uh, gathered in the government general. There's uh, 40,000 in uh, East Prussia, still the uh, old part of, of, of the German Reich. Um, 40,000 in uh, Vartaland, which um, has a kind of status between becoming a, a gal of uh, Germany and a, a kind of special administrative region, almost similar to the government general, but it is the intention of Vardalan to be completely Germanized as quickly as possible. Um, June 1941, of course, is a, a critical uh, date where everything begins to change um, in uh, on June 
1941, uh, the Nazis, of course, launch Operation Barbarossa. Uh, approximately 3 million German soldiers and um, Italian, Romanian, Bulgarian, and Hungarian allies will launch this surprise attack uh, and, and Finns as well, uh, will launch this surprise attack into Russia. Um, it, of course, brings the Soviet Union into the sphere of the Allies. Suddenly, Russia, which had been um, allied with Nazi Germany, becomes our ally. Um, and Hitler, in the meantime, has all sorts of uh, plans for what he's going to do in Russia. And, and of course, one of the plans is to immediately depopulate uh, the grain and food regions, convert the local population to slave labor, and kill whoever um, uh, remains, whoever might not be necessary as agricultural uh, labor. Um, Hitler, uh, on the eve of the invasion, um, issues a criminal order. It's a written order, the so-called Commissar Bethel, uh, the Commissar Order. It specifies that captured commissars who are Communist Party officials in um, serving in the uniform of uh, the Russian military. They're actually the commissars, but they're part of the Red Army. Um, uh, if they're captured, they are ordered to be immediately turned over to the SS and Gestapo for immediate execution. Um, we, we have these orders on, on paper, unlike, as I mentioned in the previous uh, lecture, unlike the order for the final solution. We've never found the actual order on paper, had it ever existed on paper. Most accounts of the order being given by Hitler are um, claimed that the account was a verbal Fuhrer order. So as the German army on, uh, as they say, on June 22nd begins to push into Russia, uh, following closely behind it, arrangements have been made for the mobile killing units, the Einsatzgruppen, these are battalion sized killing units divided into smaller platoons of uh, killers known as the Einsatzkommandos, uh, for them to follow behind um, the German army and to quote officially, quote, to pacify the population. There are four Einsatzgruppen, A, B, C, and D, uh, geographically from north to uh, south. Um, they are not given a specific order to target Jews. The order is to pacify potential resistance, kill all communist officials, members of uh, the party, uh, kill and pacify partisans, guerrillas. Uh, in other words, um, make occupied Russia behind German lines safe for the German army. But immediately, these orders are interpreted as well as um, having to kill any Jew found of uh, military age, uh, primarily males. And, and that, of course, comes out of this, this um, Judeo-Bolshevik theory that Bolshevism and Judaism um, are one and the same thing. Um, and therefore, if you're ordered to um, kill communists, you're going to automatically kill Jews. These units now fan out throughout 
Russia in uh, the first two months of the invasion from June through July. They round up, as I say, male-aged men and uh, begin massacring them in these uh, shootings, open air, so-called open air shootings. They're either shot down into mass graves, uh, tank ditches, trenches, or into newly dug uh, graves by these various Einsatz commando groups. Um, you can see from the, these previous photographs here that every killer has their own victim to kill. Um, this is very much opposite to, for example, German military executions by firing squad, where here you can see um, something like uh, perhaps even um, over a dozen soldiers executing one individual in a kind of formal firing squad. And, and um, often tradition has it that a blank round is uh, given to one of the soldiers. They don't know um, who has the blank round. So when they all uh, open fire together, um, all of them can imagine when they come home that perhaps they did not kill that particular victim. Maybe they had the, the, the blank round in their rifle. Um, no such kind of measures are taken with these Einsatzgruppen killers. Uh, as I say, each one kills their own victim one on one on one. And, and of course, we're going to see that it will have tremendous psychological repercussions on uh, not only the killers, but eventually on how the victims will be treated and how they will be indeed killed. But that essentially distinguishes Einsatzgruppen uh, murders from uh, general um, court martial um, firing squads or um, often massacres perpetrated by. Uh, by the German military. As I say, every perpetrator has their own uh, victim. The um, Einsatzgruppen also to make things easier for themselves, mobilize the general population to participate in these massacres, uh, once again, as they're going into regions of Russia that um, are, of course, have suffered under Stalin's repressive regimes, um, that whole myth that, um, uh, you know, the Jews are in charge, the Jews are in charge of the Russian secret police and, and, and so forth is spread throughout the population. And um, these pogroms, these attacks on Jews as German soldiers or Einsatzgruppen just stand aside and let locals uh, run amok in towns uh, attacking Jews that are essentially their neighbors, fellow townspeople, um, are, are now massacred throughout the spring of 1941 in, in, in these horrific killings. Um, some of these um, public killings are, of course, undertaken by agents of the German uh, security services. For example, this individual um, has been identified uh, as a member of the Ukrainian militia that um, the Germans are organizing. So some of these pogroms are confidentially organized by various security organizations that the Nazis are setting up in occupied territories. Here you can see a, a just a German soldier walking away, turning his back on what is um, occurring. Again, standing, uh, you can see a German soldier in the background just standing as this woman a uh, Jewish woman is uh, attacked in Lvov in uh, the Ukraine. These massacres are particularly uh, brutal. In fact, some 
German troops are actually aghast and horrified by what they see. And it's exactly what the Hitler wanted to avoid. Um, again, the Hitler spoke about the need, as I say, for scientific anti-Semitism, uh, cold anti-Semitism. He saw these public pogroms and massacres of Jews as, as being unproductive. But they are occurring. This is certainly a strategy that is undertaken by the German forces as they enter Eastern Europe. Um, here you're looking at quite a famous uh, massacre that takes place in Kovno in, in Lithuania, where again, uh, local civilians uh, with iron bars begin to um, beat to death a number of Jews from uh, the town of Kovno. Uh, they're, they're massacred in the yard of a, of a garage. By July, Heydrich and, and Himmler are unsatisfied with the number of shootings that the Einsatzgruppen have undertaken. Um, they feel that it's not enough, that um, the Einsatzgruppen are misinterpreting their orders to pacify the uh, population. So far, the Einsatzgruppen have not been targeting women and, and children or, or even youths. Um, the order goes out that all males uh, over the age of 14 are to be shot. Uh, and, and, and so now the Einsatzgruppen proceed to uh, kill young um, adolescent teenagers, and it's still not enough. And again, no explicit order goes out, but Heiner Himmler essentially circulates a memorandum throughout the Einsatzgruppen that um, they are not, quote, thorough enough. Nothing more is said. Uh, but the Einsatz group and commanders all immediately understand uh, what that means. Uh, it means um, go back, back to the starting line on the border and do it again. This time include the women and, and children. And, and so starting uh, near the end of July, the Einsatz group and now begin what's known as the second sweep where um, they'll, of course, kill any remaining males that they missed in the first sweep, but now begin shooting women and children en masse. Entire um, families, villages um, are gathered in ravines and tank ditches. Uh, for example, in Babiar, in Kiev, uh, 34,000 civilians, mostly women and children, will be murdered uh, in a one-day period. You're talking about uh, approximately 700 uh, murders per hour over that period. People are uh, stripped of their belongings, their clothing, and then lined up and executed in these uh, mass ditches and, and, and then um, uh, buried on the spot. No one is spared. Again, the shootings often are one-on-one. -on -one. Here you can see an Einsatz group and sergeant. Um, kind of shooting his victim in front of all these uh, witnesses just standing there, some of them obviously quite aghast at, at, at what they're looking at. Notice, um, again, he's, he's using this small handgun specifically um, designed for police purposes, the Walter PPK. 
PPK stands for uh, uh, polit um, um, Polizei Pistola Corte, short police pistol. It's a uh, small caliber weapon. It's intended for, again, close quarters use. Um, these individuals who conduct these executions using the PPK uh, often get the nickname Gnicks Schussen Specialisten, uh, neck shot specialists, uh, because um, they, they develop this system where they can just bend the person's head in uh, a specific uh, angle and, and when they uh, fire a shot into their neck, the bullet traverses their brain, instantly uh, killing them. Um, the small caliber of the weapon, of course, also uh, prevents kind of blowback of blood and, and uh, brain matter that comes from executing someone at such close quarters. Um, and, and, and so again, the value of a small caliber weapon to whoever the executioner is. This is, of course, the James Bond gun, the Walter PPK that, that um, has, has kind of been popularized in all these Bond movies, but it's, it's a major uh, tool, actually, of, of, of the Holocaust. There you have a uh, Genickschussen Specialisten. Heydrich uh, personally chooses the commanders of the Einsatzgruppen and the Einsatzkommandos. Uh, um, there are a total of between 3,000 and uh, 4,000 men. As I say, each Einsatzgruppen is of battalion size, approximately 1,000 men. They're all led by 380 officers, personally chosen by Heydrich from the security services. Um, Heydrich is almost as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a form of a kind of revenge and punishment of intellectuals in the security service assigning them to these killing duties. Um, many of them are university graduates who joined the RSHA uh, with a various specialty, assuming they're going to be intelligence analysts, that they're going to work from behind the desk. Um, you saw when I described RSHA, some of the kind of various research they would have uh, undertaken. Uh, so many of them thought this was a safe place to work. And now in 1941, as the Einsatzgruppen are being gathered shortly before the invasion, um, Heydrich essentially starts telling many of these officers that, well, it's time for you to uh, do some field service now. You can't spend the rest of your career uh, behind a desk. You need to bloody your hands a little bit. And, and so he starts assigning these desk officers to supervise these shootings. And many of them will be um, arrested after the war. And of course, we have that uh, Green Series trial of the Einsatzgruppen officers. 43% um, of them uh, have a university degree and uh, many of them are um, have doctorates. 25% uh, were lawyers or law clerks, that's a full quarter of the killers. 27% uh, were ranking police officials. The remaining professions are listed as um, architect, baker, barber, bartender, bookseller, businessman, chemist, church clergy dental technician, economist, electrician, engineer, farmer, locksmith, mechanic, opera singer, school teacher, truck driver. Uh, 
Um, so they come from various uh, backgrounds, but as I say, 43%, nearly 50% have a university uh, degree, and some, as I say, have a, a, a doctor in front of their name. 68% um, were born between 1900 and 1910. So they were between the ages of 31 and 41. Um, that, of course, precludes them uh, being educated in the Nazi primary school system. So, um, you know, the excuse that, well, you know, they've been uh, kind of brainwashed since they were adolescents doesn't really apply to these individuals as um, they were adults by the time the Nazis had uh, taken power. So again, 68% um, between 31 and 41 years of age. Uh, the youngest was 20, the oldest uh, was 59. 87% were uh, married, 329 officers, one engaged, six widowers, uh, five divorced. So from 380 officers, 27 were single. So these killers were essentially um, family men with many of them with, with, with children. Uh, and, and yet they uh, were finding themselves conducting these uh, executions. Um, we're talking approximately 1.2 to 1.4 million killings by shots to the head. Um, this is what's been recently called as the Holocaust by bullets, uh, single shots. Uh, born by individuals. Um, in the summer of 1941, as these shootings are progressing, Himmler decides that he's going to tour in central Russia in the Minsk region. He's, he's going to tour these shooting sites um, just to see for himself how things are going and why the progress might have been uh, slow. He is hosted by the security police commander in the central region, um, uh, SS General Eric von dem Bach Zalewski. You can stand, you see him, he's standing in the background, the individual with um, the eyeglasses there. Bach Zalewski himself um, will be Germany's partisan guerrilla fighter. Um, he will, as I say, tour uh, Heinrich Himmler and his adjutant, General Karl Wolf, the guy in the in 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 the center, through some of these um, shooting operations. So, as I say, Himmler can see for himself what is 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 happening. Bach Zalewski himself is having mental issues with the shootings he's um, witnessing, despite kind of his reputation as a uh, as a um, you know guerrilla fighter, he has uh, problems sleeping nights. Um, he often wakes up in the middle of the night with nightmares, dreaming that um, Jews that he had witnessed being killed are crawling out from under his bed with these hideous head wounds and, and that they're crawling up his leg. He wakes up in the middle of the night screaming. He begins to develop physical uh, symptoms. Um, he loses the ability to defecate. Um, he has to be hospitalized. His stools begin to calcify in his body. They have to be surgically removed. So at one point, uh, Bach Zalewski um, has to be, um, as I say, hospitalized with psychiatric traumatic issues 
from what he's witnessing. And, and of course, he himself is not shooting anybody. He's just um, ordering other people to shoot. And, and yet he is having these tremendous uh, nightmares. Not that it will stop um, Bach Zalewski later on from committing further atrocities during um, uh, the war. Eventually, Bach Zalewski will be the commander in Warsaw and will suppress um, the Warsaw Rebellion. Again, not the Warsaw Ghetto Rebellion of 1943, but the 1944 Warsaw Uprising um, of, of, of all the Poles, uh, in which he kills approximately a quarter million Poles uh, during this, this uprising. So, as I say, that, you know, his nightmares didn't exactly stop him from going on to perpetrate this um, killing. Himmler famously, uh, at this shooting, sees a uh, young Jewish boy who is blonde and blue-eyed, about to be executed. Um, he stops, he pulls the boy from the execution and, and begins to question him. Um, uh, you know, you're, you're blonde, you're blue-eyed, uh, are, are, are you really Jewish? Um, the boy confirms that, in fact, he's... Uh, um, you know, he's he's Jewish and uh, Himmler ends up kind of shrugging his shoulders and, 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 and it tells the boy, well, um, too bad, go run along back to the uh, mass grave to be shot. Uh, and and, and um, as the shooting proceeds, a fragment of brain matter from one of the shootings kind of flies through the air and and hits Himmler on um, lands on Himmler's sleeve and um, Himmler is aghast and begins to swoon he almost faints and a number of um, SS men have to come up and hold Himmler up from, from fainting. And it's at this moment that Bach Zalewski now loses his temper with Heinrich Himmler. Uh, and um, he, he turns on, on, on Himmler, um, you know, deferentially, you know, uh, obviously, he says to uh, Himmler, sir, uh, you see, you know, you, this is just one shooting and, and look how you've reacted to it. Imagine my men for the last two months have been killing hundreds of people like this one by one every day. What do you think is going to happen to them when they come back to Germany? Um, he says, you know, these men are finished. Fertig. Um, they um, are, are just going to be mental patients when they return back to, to Germany. We, we cannot go on shooting women and children uh, this way uh, one by one. It's, it's, it's um, destroying our, our, our own soldiers. And of course, what Bach Zalewski is suffering from, and uh, a lot of the Einsatz group and shooters, is what we refer to today as PIPTSD, perpetration induced post traumatic stress disorder. Um, uh, post traumatic stress disorder is something that not only um, a victim can. Um, endure, but as well the perpetrator of the violent act can in some cases develop their own forms of PTSD if they kind of have mixed feelings about what they're doing. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll certainly see that many of the Einsatzgruppen um, shooters are, are very ambivalent about um, anti-Semitism, they're not particularly anti-Semitic one way um, or the other, like 70% of the Germans, but now find themselves in this position where they're killing women and children, and we begin to see a high rate of um, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, and particularly methamphetamine, 
Um, we see uh, the rate of divorce, suicide, um, uh, nervous breakdowns increase at a dramatic rate among the Einstein's group in shooters. I used to assign this book um, in this course, Ordinary Men, the Reserve Battalion 101 and the Final Solution in Poland by Christopher R. Browning. And um, it's a very interesting book in the sense that Christopher Browning looks at not Einsatz group and shooters that are part of the security apparatus, but just ordinary policemen that find themselves on duty behind German lines are not part of the security apparatus, but are seconded one day to suddenly start shooting again Jewish women and, and, and children to help the Einsatz group in. And, and of course, what happens is uh, profoundly interesting. Christopher Browning discovers uh, that among these individuals, um, typically in the way Sarah Gordon has divided the German population, kind of 70% are um, give or take 5% five uh, percent on each end are kind of ambivalent but you know 10 to 15 percent are uh, pro anti-semitic policies uh 10 to 15 percent against anti-semitic policies the same thing happens among these ordinary cops who are now given orders to shoot individuals um they first of all their commander immediately prior to as he's giving the order, tells them that none of them have to do this, that anybody who wants to step out from committing these murders uh, can do so with no punishment and, and, and um, you know, no, no consequence. And indeed, Typically, as Sarah Gordon has divided the population in this police battalion, we find that approximately 10% to 15% of the police officers uh, refuse to participate in the killing. Uh, and uh, 10 to 15% uh, just really got into it and were very enthusiastic about perpetrating these murders, while 70% in the middle just went along uh, and, um, you know, were certainly grumbled about it. They uh, um, did not particularly um, enjoy doing this, but nonetheless, they did it because they felt that they were obligated to the team, to their comrades, to do what they saw was a disgusting thing to be uh, doing. And that's the horror of these shootings and, execution, and executions. We often, when we look at these killers, we ask, well, you know, didn't they feel any kind of revulsion to, for, for what they were doing? Um, they actually did. They were revolted by what they were doing, but uh, the horrible thing is, is that they went ahead and did it anyway. Um, and Christopher Browning, in interviewing some of these perpetrators and looking at the court records of this particular police battalion, um, testimony from these shootings concludes that the main thing that drove these individuals to perpetrate these murders was their um, sense of comradeship or, as I say, obligation to the team, to their particular unit. Uh, we don't have on record anywhere a single German soldier or SS man um, or any other police functionary who refuse to kill women and children being punished in any way. Um, they were not sent to the Eastern Front. They were not punished. They were not executed themselves or sent to concentration camps that, um, like I said, not a single 
episode on record. Um, they, of course, probably would not have been promoted in the future. Um, their their uh, service record might um, be tainted, but none of the kind of draconian punishments that are often claimed, you know, well, if I didn't shoot these people, I would be shot myself, or I would uh, end up in a concentration camp. Uh, that's a lie that um, never um, occurred. So again, no, um, no German functionary in the field has ever been punished for refusing orders to uh, kill women and children. And in fact, in the case of uh, Police Battalion 101, their commander, uh, Colonel Trapp, um, told his men, those that want to step out and not do this further can, can do so. So Christopher Browning's book uh, kind of tracks how this uh, process developed and, and um, what happened essentially to the 70% who kind of grudgingly went along with it. Many of them started developing various psychological uh, defense tactics, um, uh, you know, to be able to continue repeating, repeatedly uh, committing these massacres that, that um, they would find repulsive. Himmler himself now um, makes a speech to the Einsatz group and killers. Uh, he tells them that he would be ashamed of them if any of them did this gladly or if they enjoyed doing what they're doing. He said that they're making a sacrifice by committing these horrible shootings, they're sacrificing themselves for the good of uh, the German people. He says that um, it's a glorious page in their history that shall never be written down. Um, and what makes them great is that they can commit these horrific acts and remain decent human beings. And um, killing with decency, decent killing, will be kind of the watchword of the SS and the motto that Himmler now tries to infuse into this killing process. He, he is very much concerned um, with a, a, a kind of decent way to murder all, all, all these uh, people. And um, just to what extent he, he, he pursues this, um, I've put this article, this last article in your list of readings a few days ago. Um, we have the case of uh, Max Taubner, an SS officer who is tried by an SS court martial for killing Jews. Um, he carries out thousands of killings, but without orders, and in a particular savage way. And, and so he's arrested and court martialed. Um, part of the problem is also that he's taken photographs and he's sending photographs to his friends and, and, and relatives. Um, that's kind of the crux of the case against them. But I've added this article, uh, as I say, a few days ago, Unworthy Behavior, the case of the SS officer Max Taubner. And it's an interesting case um, as, as you read it, uh, because, you know, here on, on, on one hand, you have um, Heinrich Himmler trying to uh, inspire his men to kill more, um, you know, you're not thorough enough. And yet at the same time, here's a guy who uh, kills several thousand Jews without his, without orders on his own. Uh, and he ends up being court martial for doing that. And, and, and so we see that the verdict of the court, um, Max Taubner, 24th of May, 1943, 
um, the court concludes it he, he could have been executed. He is eventually his uh, death sentence is commuted by uh, Himmler, but um, the conclusion is is that. Um, real hatred of the Jews was the driving motivation for the accused. Um, and so in the process, he lets himself to be drawn into commu commuting cruel actions. In other words, Himmler expects his men to murder millions of women and children in an uncruel or, quote, decent way. And, and so Max Taubner, because... Um, he tortures some of his victims before killing them, um, is accused of a killing in a way that's unworthy of a German man and an SS officer, um, that he's applying Bolshevik methods during the necessary extermination of the worst enemy of our people. And moreover, of course, by taking photographs of the incidents or having photographs taken, uh, by having these developed in photographic shops and showing them to his wife and friends, the accused is guilty of dis disobedience. So um, there were, um, as you read the article, you'll see there's a number of charges that are leveled um, against uh, Taubner. And, 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 and of course, Himmler doesn't know what to do. Um, he he wants this guy punished because he thinks that he's enjoying the killing too much. Uh, on the other hand, he doesn't want to send the, the wrong message to his uh, soldiers who he is urging to be more thorough. So it's, it's, it's um, once again, it's this search for a decent way of killing as, as of course, as paradoxical as that uh, can be. And so Himmler now, having witnessed these executions, orders the SS hierarchy to come up with a better way of killing people, a more humane way, he says, of, of, of killing people where they won't suffer. Um, and of course, the point is, is not, of course, a um, humane way out of concern for the victim, but of course, as you can understand, a humane way victims not suffering so that the killers are not traumatized um, or, or themselves kind of become um, unhinged by the killing. So he wants some easy way um, kind of as they had wanted during T4 when uh, nurses were being traumatized by dragging kids into gas chambers. Um, they're looking for some way to relieve the, the trauma of killing from the killers. And so um, in Bach Zalewski's region, they begin experimenting uh, with various ways of, of uh, killing groups of people instantly if possible um the the they first attempt um killing people and they they use um psychiatric patients for the experiments in minsk uh with um uh, explosives they they pack explosives around a group of people and detonate it um, it doesn't work. The problem, of course, is is uh, somebody afterwards has to clean up um, body parts. There are body parts hanging from the trees and, 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 and so forth. And um, neither are explosive necessarily effective. Some people are left alive. You know, their limbs are maybe blown off, but they're still alive. And, and, and then they have to be put to death. So very quickly they learn um, that... Um, using explosives is not going to be an effective way that's not going to help with 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 the trauma and so now they turn to again the specialists in the the, the chemical forensic branch of uh the creepel uh department um 5d2 forensic biochemistry and they immediately think of what they had done in T4, the use of carbon monoxide. But the problem, of course, is, is um, by 1941, bottling, 
carbon monoxide in metal cylinders and then transporting them to the eastern front where the killing is going on is not really viable. Uh, but they think carbon monoxide in other forms can still maybe work. And, 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 and so um, this particular individual, Walter Rauf, comes up with an idea um, why don't we use the carbon monoxide that comes out of a, a vehicle engine's exhaust? And so um, Walter Ralph tries building this um, improvised gas chamber where he runs carbon monoxide from and just a, a, a car engine running. He measures how long it takes to uh, kill people uh, just from running a car engine. And um, they're not quite satisfied with the process because, of course, again, somebody um, has to then empty out the uh, gas chamber. The bodies have to be then transported and disposed of somehow. Uh, and 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 moreover, a single car engine really doesn't produce sufficient carbon monoxide that you can kill masses of, 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 of people. So the next thing that Ralph comes up with, um, are, of course, is the gas uh, van. Um, uh, the gas van will have its exhaust cycled back into the cab in the back. Uh, people will be forced into the van for transport, they're told. And unknowingly, of course, as they're being driven to already a pre-dug grave, they succumb to the gas in the back and, and they arrive already dead. So um, these gas vans are uh, the first attempt at finding a, a quicker and cleaner way, a more humane, humane, quote, humane way of killing victims. Uh, there are problems, of course. Um, one of the problems is that the van um, can only take 50 people at a time, 50 to 75 people. Uh, moreover, graves are often built in the countryside, so the van has to go off-road uh, to empty the corpses from the back into a mass grave. And, and um, it's not really built for off-road travel. And, and, and so they can load less people into a van. So 50 to 75 people at a time, plus the time it takes to drive them to the location, um, clean out the van, drive it back to pick up more victims. 75 people at a time is not going to achieve the, the million numbers that um, uh, the Nazis intend to um, kill, essentially. And so we're talking here um, about the summer of 1941 as these Einsatz group and are committing these these open air uh, killings and and yet um, as I keep telling you the final solution really isn't decided upon or um, implemented in any systemic way until uh, somewhere September or October of 1941. So um, what is going on here? Um, why are all these killings taking place? Um, all these plans being made and, and, and yet no one has made that uh, decision on, on the final solution. And that of course brings us to this great historical argument in Holocaust studies that began in the 1990s between um, the intentionalist historians and the functionalist um, historians. And, and, and um, this kind of paradoxical open air killing and yet the confinement of Jews in Poland into ghettos uh, alive 
is what fuels this kind of intentionalist functionalist um, argument. Um, intentionalists basically point to Mein Kampf and Hitler's speeches where he warns that if Germany is attacked, it will mean the end of um, the Jews. Uh, they um, connect the extermination of the Jews directly with the express intention of Adolf Hitler to always do this. Uh, but, you know, there are problems, you know, after careful analysis of the Third Reich, we see, in fact, um, it was not the monolithic state we often thought it was. Um, it's chaotically authoritarian with overlapping lines of command and initial kind of um, individual kind of initiative encouraged by the Hitler. Um, the statements that Hitler makes are uh, few and far in, in, in between. Um, we don't have, again, any evidence for a written order. Um, you know, we have written orders for the Commissar Befel. We have written order for T4. Those were um, illegal orders, uh, yet we don't have that written order ordering that um, the Jews of Europe are now going to be uh, put, put to death. Um, what we have, of course, are verbal orders, apparently, but um, our, our, even our record of verbal orders is all secondhand hearsay, um, especially if you read um, that Max Taubner article again. Um, you need to read it, in fact, um, because Max Taubner's defense in the SS court is very interesting. He, his defense is going to be, I was only following orders. Uh, and uh, Max Taubner claims that there's a Fuhrer order to kill all the Jews of Europe. And the SS judge, this is a judge in the SS judiciary who must have known and seen all sorts of dirty laundry uh, within the SS organization, is very puzzled on hearing that there's a Fuhrer order to kill the Jews, according to Max Taubner. And, and, and so he begins to inquire to senior judges in the SS, is there such a thing as a Fuhrer order uh, to kill the Jews? Because he certainly had not ever heard this. And, and, and so what um, the judge in the Max Taubner case finds out is um, again very interesting and and um, you know certainly a, a, a comment on um, the intentionalist functionalist um, argument just exactly how those orders might have been expressed and 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 uh, passed on but clearly there's no documentation uh, of the order nor do we have a, a a kind of any kind of preparatory organizational documents um, for what's going to become the final solution. It, it, it just suddenly um, is launched uh, without any kind of uh, memorandums, budgetary uh, preparations. Um, it will be announced at the Wansay conference when, when I'll get to that in a minute, but um, we, we um, don't really have a, a clear, specific plan, apparently, for the intentional murder of um, the Jews. Perhaps that's not the best way of putting it, intentional murder, because they're all, um, uh, you know, certainly these are intentional murders, but um, I'm saying the intention to commit genocide. In other words, um, when the Nazis began establishing ghettos and introduced their uh, anti-Semitic laws, uh, in that period, they did not know that they would be eventually killing the Jews. It's something that they discovered for themselves later. And so this functionalist model rejects the kind of Hitler-centric ideological intentionalist model. Um, the functionalists argue that the Holocaust occurs without 
any explicit order from Hitler. And, and they point to kind of the twisted, chaotic, contradictory path taken by um, Nazi anti-Jewish policies and um, argue that the Nazis are not operating programmatically towards a premeditated final goal. And so um, the final solution, the functionalists argue, the decision to kill the Jews was perhaps arrived by lower bureaucratic ranks seeking to interpret Hitler's uh, wishes on their own um, initiative. Uh, Ian Kershaw, the historian, Ian Kershaw described it as, quote, working toward the Fuhrer. Uh, what will please the Fuhrer? Kind of gauging Hitler's reaction. Um, and, 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 and so the argument is, is that Hitler never issued an actual order to kill the Jews, but kind of let people know that that's what he wanted to have happen. That the decision was made by lower ranks at different points in time, in different places at different times, by different groups of officials, without any explicit orders from uh, Hitler's. Uh, you know, um, so in other words, the Holocaust proceeded kind of on its own in different regions, in different times, in different um, ways. Um, we can kind of maybe draw a parallel between organized crime murders, where a, uh, say, an organized crime boss says to his minions, uh, you know, that witness testifying tomorrow, um, boy, it would be great if he didn't testify. And then the next day, um, uh, the guy is found in the trunk of a car. All right? and, and, of course, the boss says, well, I never told anybody to kill anybody. All I said was um, it, it, it would be uh, great if the guy didn't testify. I never said to anybody, you know, uh, kill him, kill the witness. And, and, and so the functionalists kind of interpret Hitler's position in a similar way that Hitler kind of set up a climate, um, you know, Europe will be better without any Jews, uh, but it's up to the lower ranks to interpret how that's going to be achieved. And, and essentially, um, we're going to see a moment when one lower ranking functionary just begins to systematically kill Jews in his territory, and Hitler kind of smiles or nods in that direction, and everybody um, takes their cue from it. Um, it's been described as a kind of cumulative radicalization. Um, Hitler is awarding the most radical generals in the army, the most radical diplomats in the, the, the foreign service. And, and, and so we begin to see that the radicals begin to come forward. And when Hitler responds positively to radical policies, other bureaucrats begin to take their cue from that. Ah, that's what the Fuhrer wants, cumulative um, radicalization. And, and so out of this kind of Byzantine chaotic authoritarian system, you begin to see the emergence of a, a species of genocidal consensus for the final solution. Um, a function, essentially, of the system of, of, of um, governance, thus that term functionalism. So this is essentially the, the functionalist model that's um, advanced by, fun, you know, the, 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 the functionalists. And, and, of course, what happens to the Polish Jews is is part very much of the evidence for functionalism. Um, you know, why are Jews in Poland uh, relatively untouched by the killing process um, in 1939 and 1940, in the beginning of 1941? Um, and yet, 
uh, they're being uh, massacred in uh, Russia. Uh, so again, that's kind of evidence that the functionalists look at at this notion of, again, uh, fragmentary development of uh, the final solution. Um, and neither side really prevailed in this um, argument, although I, I, I would say the functionalists are, are, are kind of the newer um, school of his, historians. So, so functionalism kind of is taking and probably has taken a greater hold over um, the intentionalist argument that this was always the plan and Hitler had always intended to, uh, to do this. Um, you have even um, kind of radical factions within these. For example, you have um, ultra functionalists that argue that Hitler didn't even know that the Jews were being killed. It's 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 kind of a ridiculous argument, but um, you know that that um, Hitler was completely left out of the loop. Uh, kind of again, you know. It's best that he doesn't know, he doesn't want to know uh, kind of theory. Um, some argue that there's a kind of an anti-Bolshevik imperative. And we saw that, of course, in the Einsatz group in shootings, that um, this kind of um, anti-Bolshevik crusade was grafted on to the Holocaust, that right to the end, Nazi Germany felt it was fighting Bolshevism and that um, Jews are equivalent to Bolsheviks. So if we're going to fight Bolshevism, we have to fight uh, Judaism. Um, there is, of course, also the eugenics model, kind of the vision of the, the Volksgemeinschaft, that there's no room for anybody who did not fit the so-called Aryan I I ideal, including, of course, um, uh, you know, disabled Germans, uh, the, the Roma people, gypsies, um, Poles, and um, of course, eventually Jews, that they were all killed as a larger process of um, eugenics, um, as opposed to maybe strictly anti-Semitism, although the difference kind of um, becomes a, a little gray here. Um, Hilberg argues for the kind of bureaucratic, technocratic impulse um, that, that there's a kind of a Faustian competitive creative temptation in the Third Reich bureaucracy to accomplish something that had never been done before. That bureaucrats love a challenge uh, and they love finding a solution for it. And so um, Heilberg argues for a kind of a bureaucratic, quote, shared comprehension and synchronicity to solve a problem. And so um, other historians kind of follow in Hilberg's path, suggesting again that low ranking bureaucrats kind of assess the notion of Hitler's Lebensraum in the form of social planning and economic demographic policy that was predicated on restructuring and modernizing and overpowered, or sorry, overpopulated but underdeveloped East by the elimination of the Jews and Slavs in these uh, Nazi colonies. So um, it was about bureaucratic number crunching and technocracy, how to achieve a utopian Nazi vision. And the bureaucrats were simply like scientists developing a nuclear weapon. Um, they didn't have a particular um, hate for who the target of that weapon are going to be. They just enjoyed as bureaucrats finding a successful uh, solution. And, and thus you have this uh, kind of, um, you know, bureaucratic consensus that, that emerges. Um, you have as well moderate intel in intentionalists. Um, they kind of step back from the simplistic uh, quote, Hitler intended it from the beginning 
uh, position. They, they um, kind of um, refer to a planlessness of um, Hitler's Nazi Jewish policies that top Nazi leaders around Hitler really did not know from the beginning that they were going to murder the European Jews. It, it's almost like functionalism, uh, except that Hitler still knows that his eventual intention is to murder the Jews. Um, and, and he tries to signal this to his underlings, uh, but he fails. They don't take the hint, essentially, until 1941. Um, other moderate intentionalists argue that everybody knew, but the um, uh, sorry, the, um, uh, moderate intentionalists argue that everybody knew um, that um, they were intending to kill the Jews, but that they had to wait for an opportune moment to do this. Thus, uh, the delay. So. Um, the most recent and probably master work on the evolution of the final solution is uh, by Christopher Browning, again, uh, The Origins of the Final Solution, The Evolution of Nazi Jewish Policy, September 1939 to March 1942. It's a massive book that um, looks at, at this question of intentionalism and functionalism and, and the decision uh, to implement the final solution. Uh, Christopher Browning places it somewhere between August and October of 1941. Uh, there is a shorter article he writes based on his book, if you can get a hold of it, um, beyond intentionalism and functionalism, a reassessment of Nazi Jewish policy in which he kind of summarizes his, his, his argument and can be found in uh, this collection, reevaluating the Third Reich and, and perhaps other Christopher Browning articles over the last uh, decade on uh, the final solution might be available in, in um, other forms and, and, and uh, sources. Um, Browning essentially argues that it was the intention of the Nazis to expel the Jews, that that had always been uh, the intention of, of the Nazis until 1941. And, and he describes a number of attempted and failed deportations in 1940 and 1941 that were um, abandoned and interrupted for various reasons, primarily military priorities. Um, and a, a Browning argues that the failure of these expulsions finally drove the Nazis to resort uh, to, to, uh, to, to murder, essentially. In um, Browning's model, uh, contrary to many functionalists, um, Hitler certainly plays an active and vital role in the decision-making process from expulsion to extermination. So Browning might even be um, labeled as, as kind of a post-functionalist Holocaust historian. And, uh, you know, we do have this issue over um, the ghettos, um, just to what extent were the ghettos um, uh, a preparatory phase for extermination, as Hilberg argues, or, or were they actually a preparatory gathering of uh, Jews who were going to be then expelled to, as a you know, Ma Madagascar or other parts of um, occupied U Europe, and we see in the primary cities, Lodz, Warsaw, Lublin, in those ghettos where you have these large populations of Jews, um, that as the Nazis are killing people in eastern 
regions of Russia in, in the Soviet Union, in Lithuania, Latvia, Belarus, the, the, the Ukraine, um, essentially making those regions, as the Nazis would label, label it, Judenfrei, free of uh, Jews. At the same time, they're beginning in Germany and in other occupied regions, deporting Jews from Europe into those regions where they just finished killing off all the Jews there. Um, beyond Lodge, Warsaw, and Lublin, you of course have Minsk, Kovno, Vilna, Riga, where in, uh, from June to August of 1941, you had these massive uh, killings of, of Jews. Practically all the Jews in those regions were killed off. And then suddenly Jews from Germany and from other parts of Europe begin to be brought into the very same regions where the Einsatzgruppen just finished killing the Jews. Right there, Kovno, Vilna, Minsk, Riga. So that kind of uh, makes us wonder what's, 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 what's going on. Um, the other thing is when we look at the cases of the Lodge in Warsaw Ghetto in 1940 and 1941. Um, in 1940, um, the Nazis begin to seal the ghettos and they prohibit Jews in the ghetto from trading with people outside the ghetto. And, and, and of course, this uh, uh, triggers this massive starvation and, and deprivation in, in, in uh, the ghetto. Uh, in the case of Lodge, for example, um, the deputy head of the ghetto administration, Alexander Paufinger, uh, is warned that if something isn't done, all the Jews in the ghetto will soon be dead. And um, Paufinger says, quote, a rapid dying out of the Jews is for us a matter of total indifference, if not to say desirable. Yet his boss, Hans Bibau, disagrees. He argues that the Germans should facilitate the self-maintenance of Jews by finding them work. And he even advocates that the German government now um, give subsidies to the Jewish ghettos uh, to get people back working and, and eating again. And October 1940, German authorities agree with Bau, Bibau. And the order is issued, 18th of October 1940, that the ghetto in Lodge must continue to exist and everything must be done to make the ghetto self-sustaining. And Paufinger is... is is very disgruntled. And, and so in mid-November 1940, the Warsaw Ghetto is now sealed in the same way, and Palfinger transfers, gets a transfer to the ghetto administration there. And again, um, the district governor in Warsaw, Ludwig Fischer, now um, declares November 1940, quote, the Jews will disappear because of hunger and need and nothing will remain of the Jewish question but a cemetery. And so April 1941, there's a showdown uh, between uh, higher German authorities and they rule that the ghetto now is here for the long haul and economic planning must be um, done accordingly. And so, um, according to Walter Emmerich, the head of the economic division of um, the Third Reich, he says, quote, the starting point for all economic measures has to be the idea of maintaining the capacity of Jews to live. So, 
Palfinger is removed from the Warsaw Ghetto administration, and um, as T as RSHA is sending Einstein's group into uh, shoot Jews on mass in Russia, uh, the Warsaw Ghetto. At the same time, the Jews are being saved by delivery of uh, supplies by uh, the Nazis. Um, as 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 um, uh, the Nazis will say at that point, quote, the responsibility that the government took on with the creation of a Jewish district of 500,000 human beings is very great, and a failure would always be blamed on the authorities of the general government. In other words, uh, the ghetto we wanted to uh, live on. The problem partly also is um, Hans Frank. Hans Frank, who's appointed as uh, the governor of the government general, is at first um, very happy to get this position because it puts him in the center of uh, you know, German policy. He's now the governor of a, uh, the reservation for the Jews. But um, as he suddenly finds himself with over 2 million Jews, he is on, and, and is unable to sustain um, that many Jews in his, under his administration. And Himmler announces that he's planning to deport other Jews from Europe and Germany into the government general, Frank now begins um, to resist. And, and Frank, of course, um, while he is known, as I say, King Frank, Koenig Frank, he has all this power in the government general. He has no jurisdiction over three German agencies that are operating in the government, uh, in the general government. One, the army, um, the SS and police, who, although nominally are under Frank's command, really ignore any order he gives unless Himmler approves it. Uh, and, of course, he has no power over the railroad, the Reichsbahn, uh, which operates the, the, the Polish rail connection. That um, it kind of falls under the auspices of Hermann Goering. And so um, as Jews are um, arriving in the government in general, uh, Frank begins to realize there's a structure, um, a, 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 a strain on the infrastructure uh, that 800,000 more are scheduled to arrive. And, and uh, uh, Frank begins to fight with Himmler. And uh, February 12, 1940, uh, Frank runs to Goering, asks for help, uh, and and of course, again, you have this kind of doggy dog. Goering sees Himmler as a kind of a rival, and so Goering now, with the power he has over the railroad, uh, overrules Himmler's plans to deport uh, Jews from other regions using the railway. Um, telling Himmler that Frank must be um, informed and must approve all rail deportations into um, his territory. And um, Himmler, of course, tests this next month in March of 1940. Uh, and Goering orders that all the evacuations into the government general now have to stop on March 23rd, 1940. And this um, is this kind of beginning uh, of, 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 of um, this kind of rivalry. So uh, now Hitler is going to intervene. There's a meeting on October 2nd, 1940, and, and um, Frank and uh, Himmler and uh, the Reichs Commissioner meet with Hitler. Uh, Frank tells Hitler that his territory can't handle a population increase of the kind that's being suggested, but Hitler cuts him off and, and, and says, quote, um, that 
uh, I'm indifferent to the population density of the government general. Uh, and, and basically, the government general is to become just a huge uh, labor camp, essentially. And so the deportations begin again. What we often forget as well is, is that this isn't just simply deportations of Jews to the government general. We have three levels of uh, migrations and transports of uh, people. You have uh, Jews being deported into the eastern ghettos from um, Western Europe, from Czechoslovakia and so forth. Um, you have Jews being deported internally in Poland from the countryside into the city. And then um, in red here, you can see Poles are being expelled from East Prussia and Warteland uh, and what will be West Prussia into the government general. And so uh, Poles are, are, are now taking um, the apartments and homes of Jews expelled from the countryside, uh, while in light blue Germans, both from Germany and from uh, the Soviet Union, there are a lot of ethnic uh, Germans who lived in Russia for hundreds of years, are now being brought into Poland uh, to settle. So, so you have this kind of massive shifting of uh, demographics. And so uh, key to this process and, and what we think might have happened is uh, what's happening between the two governments, uh, between the two governors, Frank in the government general and um, a guy called Griesler in Vartaland. Griesler has 400,000 Jews in Vartaland that he has been attempting for over a year to deport next door into the government general. And Frank has been, uh, on his part, constantly sabotaging and preventing that uh, deportation. Uh, and so even when Hermann Goering um, canceled all the deportations, Griesler immediately ran to Goering and said, well, surely that doesn't include my 400,000 Jews that, that Frank had already promised to take from me. Um, and, 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 and it did. Um, Griesler still has 400,000 Jews in a territory that is supposed to be completely Germanized. And Frank is not taking them. Here's Griesler, super Nazi. And so Griesler, around September of 1941, maybe as early as August of 1941, makes the decision that he's not going to deport the Jews of Warteland, War he's just going to kill them where they are. Uh, the place is uh, Kelno. Here, Griesler uh, builds a small improvised death camp. Uh, he asks the SS to deploy a number of gas trucks at Kelno. The trucks are uh, permanently parked there, so they're not going to be used as mobile uh, gas chambers. They'll, they'll end up being used as kind of fixed gas chamber, chambers, although, as I say, they're, they're run off these truck engines. And Griesler will proceed to uh, murder the Jews of Waterland um, in, in the castle as it's known, this place at, at, at Kalno. This is kind of what it looks like today. These are the remains of, of the death camp that was built at Kalno.
And this, we believe, is the first systematic murder of uh, Jews specifically because they're Jews, not because they're uh, kind of being thrown into the mix with Bolsheviks or, uh, you know, in pacifying the population, uh, but simply because they're, they're Jews, they are uh, murdered in Waterland and, and um the bureaucrats essentially take their cue from Hitler's reaction to this, which is positive. And so now Reinhard Heydrich gives the order. Again, we don't have the, the, the detailed order, but uh, Heydrich now gives the order uh, for the systematic killing of all the Jews in uh, the government general and the deportation of all Jews from France, from uh, Germany, from everywhere else as well into uh, the government general for the purposes of uh, killing them now. This will become known as Operation Reinhardt and the camps will be known as Operation Reinhardt camps. Um, there is some question as to whether the operation is named for Reinhard Heydrich or whether um, because it's spelled with a D and uh, Reinhard did not spell his name with a D and, and so there is some speculation that actually Action Reinhard or Operation Reinhard is named for an official in the Reich's finance ministry who was in charge of banking all the property that is taken from uh, from the Jews, because we're going to see that Operation Reinhardt is in fact a a profit making operation. And nonetheless, uh, three uh, major camps, and there'll be others, uh, smaller camps, but three major camps are are going to be built under the auspices of um, Operation uh, Reinhardt. These camps will be run by the RSHA instead of the WVHA, uh, which, which um, you know, ran and will continue running the concentration camps in Germany. Um, these are, are different camps. The purposes of these camps will be to kill anybody who goes into the camp and and, and the, the camps essentially are known as annihilation camps or um, death camps or in German Vernichtungslager, um, extermination camp. Uh, very few survivors out of these, these, these camps. Um, the camps are built near the major cities, uh, Belzec, at Lublin, uh, Sobibor between Warsaw and Lublin, uh, and Treblinka north of uh, Warsaw. Um, there'll be Majdanek, which um, is a kind of a combination labor death camp uh, at Lodz, and, and of course we'll see Auschwitz will be in Upper Silesia. It won't actually be in the government general, but those camps will begin will be will not be run by the RSHA. It's essentially Treblinka, Sobibor, and Belzec that will come under the auspices of the RSHA. And so it's about this time that the systematic deportations of Jews from Germany begin uh, in late September, early October of 1941. Uh, and most of the German Jews um, are uh, deported to ghettos in Lodz, Warsaw, and beyond to Minsk, Kovno, Riga, Vilna, um, where again, the Einsatzgruppen had just finished uh, killing all the Jews there. Uh, again, the deportation program is uh, repopulating those um, areas. So Belzec, Sobibor, and Treblinka are essentially at first focused on killing Polish Jews who um, have been gathered, as I say, in the cities of Lodz, Warsaw, Lublin, uh, primarily.
And of course, you have all these arbeits loggers, labor camps that use some of the people slated to die as slaves. Uh, but um, at, as I say, is, is Sobibor and, and uh, Belzec and Treblinka, there's, there's very little slave labor. People essentially are just killed as they arrive, um, no matter what. This, of course, brings us to the question of the Wanse conference. Um, a lot of people claim that um, this is the conference where the final solution was finally uh, confirmed, that this is where the decision was made. Uh, the Wanse conference of January 20th, 1942. Um, Obviously, from what I'm telling you, it, it couldn't have been the Wanse conference because the decision, of course, had been made way back in September, um, October at the latest. Um, and indeed, originally, the Wanse conference was scheduled for December 9th of 1941. Its purpose was not to decide to implement the final solution, but to announce to other German agencies that the final solution has been adopted uh, and to begin coordinating things like the railway, the foreign office and uh, the labor ministry and so forth, uh, bring them on board into this operation. So originally scheduled for December 9th, but of course, December 7th, Pearl Harbor occurs, and 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 so Heydrich, because of uh, suddenly the United States entering the war, and there's a lot of pressure on the German bureaucracy as to how to deal with this. Germany will declare war as an ally of Japan against the United States, and and so the Wannsee Conference will actually be delayed until January 20th, 1942. But the invitations went out near the end of November essentially. It's held in um, a villa in Wannsee, which is a, a kind of a resort suburb of Berlin. It um, was the headquarters for Interpol, um, the international police, uh, kind of an international agency still operating today. Heydrich, of course, was also the president of Interpol uh, during the Nazi years. Um, Interpol, for those who aren't familiar with it, is a kind of international police agency that exchanges information on um, fugitives and wanted uh, wanted criminals. It um, police agencies assist each other uh, in identifying fugitives fleeing across borders in, in internationally. Um, it's founded way back, I think, in the 1920s, and and um, by the 1930s, Heydrich is elected as um, the president of Interpol and, and, and Interpol, as I say, is headquartered in Nazi Germany. And, and there's a lot of speculation how much Interpol actually assisted Nazi authorities in identifying Jews uh, in different countries under German occupation. You can uh, show up at Interpol headquarters today in Lyon, France, and ask to look at um, their archives from the 1940s. And, um, you know, if you do, um, you'll uh, be essentially thrown out into the street uh, as, as Interpol uh, just keeps those records highly confidential. Um, so we don't really know the role that this still functioning international agency had uh, during the times of uh, the Third Reich. Heydrich chairs uh, the meeting. Uh, Adolf Eichmann is the secretary. Um, I think approximately 30 German high-ranking bureaucrats from various agencies 
uh, are at the meeting and uh, basically they're all informed that it is the intention of um, the German government now to deport all the Jews of Europe uh, to the government general. And, and that's basically the term they'll use. Um, you'll rarely, in fact, you'll never see the term kill. Um, there's um, a thousand different words that Nazi bureaucracy used from, you know, deport, uh, special measures, uh, Sonderbehandlung, special uh, handling, um, extraordinary measures, uh, just a whole variety of bureaucratic terms, uh, deportation, single destination, deportation, and so forth. So they never use the term uh, kill. Um, all sorts of issues are worked out. For example, um, how the railways are, 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 are going to be used. The railway companies negotiate um, the the fare that the SS will pay for Jews that they'll transport. Um, uh, the railway companies will offer, for example, uh, tourist rates for you know group rates for mass deportations. Um, there's the question of since you know it's only one way, how come? you know, um, the fare isn't half of a return ticket, as anyone who's bought a one-way fare knows. Um, it's never half of a return trip because it's kind of a admi fixed administrative fee. So they have to negotiate with the railways that um, they won't use passenger cars. Instead, they'll use cattle cars. Um, the foreign office is, is, is going to assist the SS in the deportation of French Jews and, and, and Hungarian Jews and um, other Jews and, 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 and so forth so forth. So that's the one say conference. It's not where the final solution is actually um, decided upon. It's um, actually where the police and intelligence community reveals to the rest of the German bureaucracy who uh, might have not, an, you know, the so-called term need to know did not have the need to know they're now brought into the kind of the confidentiality of this project remember this is all being done in 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 secrecy um the 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 claimed intention of the deportations is that Jews are being deported to colonies where they will be uh, put to work. Um, no one is saying that they're going to be killed. So the Wannsee Conference of January 1942 essentially brings on board all the other non-police and non-intelligence, uh, non-SS agencies um, into the final solution and, and 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 so all these bureaucrats now become aware of this this group effort that's going to be undertaken and now um this is where the old staff of the t4 killing program are now redeployed to the Reinhardt uh, project. Um, somewhere as Bishop Galen is making his speech and T4 is being formally wound down uh, and some of those killing centers are are beginning to get closed down. And, and again, as I said in last lecture, historians argue whether um, it's wound down because of the public reaction to it or, or whether the Nazis had um, already killed sufficient numbers, 72,000 of um, intended victims who were um, you know, disabled or didn't fit the Volksgemeinschaft as, as, as um, wanted or, or whether the killings were simply moved 
to uh, the concentration camps under a different um, organization, under different auspices and went on. Um, you know, there are all sorts of conflicting sources on it, but the hardcore um, T4 staff under Christian Rief now um, vanish essentially between August and October of 1941. And then they pop up in Lublin, uh, where Operation Reinhardt will be uh, headquartered. Um, where they were for those three months is a matter of great speculation. One uh, possibility that is um, put forth, and, and, and there are clues that they're somewhere on the Eastern Front, the former T4 staff. And this possibly could be the last great secret of Nazi Germany. Um, the, there is speculation that the T4 staff, prior to being uh, deployed in Operation Reinhardt, were killing German military casualties who were crippled beyond uh, healing. That, in fact, um, T4 was now deployed um, against critically wounded German soldiers. Uh, and that, of course, would have been, you know, the worst thing uh, for Germans as far as, you know, Nazis are concerned, um, you know, if, if it was discovered that Hitler ordered his own German soldiers to be um, euthanized. Uh, but um, again, there is no hard evidence to this other than that uh, for three months, these guys are, 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 are just missing somewhere and they are somewhere on the Eastern Front, but what exactly they're doing there, we have no records what's, what, what, whatsoever. So it's, it's unclear. But uh, Christian Rief now will arrive with his staff at, at, at Lublin as these killing centers are, are, are closed. Here he is, Christian Rief. Um, and, and they will set up themselves um, in two buildings. This is a, a school where uh, Operation Reinhardt is uh, based and as well in, in this building in, in Lublin. Um, Christian Rief is now appointed as inspector of the Reinhardt camps and um, the T4 staff are now assigned between um, the three camps. Um, there's a staff of about 450 uh, German killers, mostly, as I say, drawn from T4 the former uh, police and, and SS guard staff that operated um, in these hospital killing centers. Court France, remember, uh, who was a cook at one of the euthanasia centers. As I say, he hadn't really killed anyone so far. Um, he only cooked for the killers. Now he's promoted. Um, he's uh, promoted as um, a, to the rank of um, SS uh, uh, Sturmführer, which is uh, a, a, a first lieutenant, and he's put in command of uh, Treblinka. He's one of the few SS men who kind of rises from the rank of uh, private all the way to an officer's rank. Here you can see three pips on his collar. That's that's a, 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 a first lieutenant in the SS, the Sturmführer. He's known as um, Lalka, nicknamed by the prisoners as the Doll. Uh, 
um, because he has these 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 kinds of um, doll-like features. He is exactly the way Himmler doesn't want his uh, killers to be. He is personally sadistic um, and and and. Um, Stories about him, uh, about his cruelty in Treblinka, uh, abound on the record. And and more, um, there's a second killer, his dog, Barry. Uh, this kind of what is he, essentially kind of a friendly, uh, slobbering Saint Bernard that um, you know prisoners play with. Uh, he's friendly with prisoners. Yeah, you can see a picture. The dog is named Barry. Uh, you know, we often know more about the dog than we do at, uh, about Court France. Um, we can see the, the photo of a dog um, at uh, the private zoo at Treblinka. Um, Court France built this petting zoo for um, the guards at, at, at Treblinka. Um, but uh, Barry, of course, is uh, notorious because his personality would completely change the moment Court France arrive, arrives on the on, on anywhere near the dog. Um, Court trained the dog um, to attack prisoners on a command, Mensch uh, schnappt den Hund, man bite dog uh, that's the order so in other words the dog is the man while the prisoner is uh, the dog uh and 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 so whenever uh court france would give the order um man uh, bite the dog uh barry would just suddenly turn into this horrific monster dog and 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 uh, just throw itself at uh prisoners there's even a uh, long op-ed article in the New York Times in 1933, uh, Treblinka's other monster, uh, describing um, the case of court France after the war. He, he does end up being uh, caught, although he's only sentenced for the horrific things he does. He, he's sentenced to 34 years in, in, in prison for killing 300,000 uh, people. That's about an hour uh, for every person he's responsible uh, for for killing. So this again, this this kind of um, sadism that begins to occur in these camps is exactly what Himmler um, wanted to avoid. Willie Metz, the farmer remember the cattleman the milkman uh, again he wasn't involved with any of the killing he occasionally would just um, eat there uh, with the killers in the cafeteria Willie Metz now is squeezed into a uniform and all the members of, of T4 now are uh, and anybody who worked there whether they were part of the SS or like Willie Metz, they were just a farmer, are, are now uh, given the ranks of sergeant in the SS. They're all squeezed into the uniform and deployed to these camps. Uh, Lawrence Hackenholt, the mechanic. Hackenholt, now uh, here he is, uh, just standing there under the, 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 the window with the staff of Belzec. Um, Hackenholt now will, as a mechanic, operate a huge tank engine uh, in, um, again, an improvised gas chamber uh, that... Uh, the Nazis named the uh, Hackenholt Institute and, and they put uh, the Star of David over um, the entryway. Um, the suggestion this uh, being a, a kind of charity installation for arriving refugees, Jews who arrive at uh, Belzec are 
uh, led to this building. They're told that um, they're going to um, be given a, a shower and then breakfast. Hurry up. Um, we're running out of uh, warm water. Your breakfast is getting cold. Please get into the shower rooms and, and have your shower. And, and then, uh, you know, breakfast is waiting for you. And uh, people now rush into um, these chambers. And, and of course, instead of uh, water coming out of the shower um, uh, heads, uh, Hockenhope now starts up the tank engine and the people are then gassed in, in these chambers and, and then side panels are opened up and the bodies are e e extracted. Uh, you can see that in, in the doorway, uh, flower plants were uh, built there. It, as I say, it looks like uh, something that um, you know, a, a Jewish community charity had built for refugees arriving on their way to these new labor colonies that they're being sent to live in. The people don't realize that they're they're uh, going to their death. So I can hope now. Uh, no longer just a mechanic working on the buses. He's now a mechanic working on the tank engine that is killing hundreds of thousands of people. The camps are relatively small. They're um, about the size, I guess, of the Ryerson campus, maybe the main the main campus. So there there are no extensive barracks for prisoners because very few prisoners are kept. Only um, a handful of prisoners are kept who um, assist the Nazis in the killing process. Um, the rest, everybody who arrives, are essentially murdered right away. Um, they're they're uh, kind of stripped of their property and, and then they're driven down um, the so-called tube, this kind of screened passageway where they're gassed in these improvised gas chambers and then their uh, bodies are burnt in these outdoor pits and um, buried on the campgrounds. So all of these camps are relatively uh, small. Um, and again, none of them survived, so we only have sketches made by former guards or by um, a few survivors. There were very few survivors in, in these three death camps. So it's unclear exactly how they were laid out. All of them are laid out um, near a railway line. Um, fake railway stations are, are built at um, the camp gate with even a fake schedule. So people think that they're arriving at some village where they're going to be uh, living and, and uh, you know, in the new community away from uh, Germans where uh, people think they'll be kind of living in a kind of rural ghetto away uh, from Germany and Poland, um, or, or, or the rest of what remained of Poland, not realizing that actually they're arriving at a death camp. There's approximately 20 to 30 Germans in each camp, so the staffs are, are very small of the T4. Uh, uh, operatives. Uh, so, you know, there's approximately maybe 120 altogether who were brought over from T4 of the hands-on killers. The rest um, are supplemented by Ukrainian volunteers. Um, these Ukrainian volunteers are trained at uh, a nearby camp called 
Travniki, they're known as Hilfswillinge, uh, auxiliary volunteer or Hiwis. Um, they, uh, of course, you have the notorious case of Demanyuk, um, a, a, one of these individuals who ended up living in Detroit and, and um, a lot of controversy about um, whether he was the infamous Ivan the Terrible who worked in one of the gas chambers or whether that was another one. But um, as I say, they're, they're um, mostly exclusively uh, Ukrainians who volunteer for this uh, duty. And, and, and so they're used as auxiliaries with essentially the German staff supervising them and running some of the key um, functions. We have very few photographs of um, taken inside these camps. Uh, they're, they're very um, fragmentary. Again, here you see uh, one SS man surrounded by um, a number of, again, Ukrainian auxiliary Hiwis. Their, their, their uniform is um, black, of course, for the Hiwis, and just um, slightly different from those worn by the German guards. A lot of um, debauchery, again, alcohol abuse, sadism, random killing, everything that the SS uh, kind of discipline did not allow for in the German concentration camps uh, um, is occurring in these uh, camps. Not much um, killing decently as um, Himmler had, had, had wanted and, and uh, claimed. And, and so you have these um, alcohol-fueled killing orgies that are, are, are going on. Um, at one point here, you can see the guy dressed in the suit on the left. They get so drunk that they accidentally push one of their friends into a gas chamber and, and, and gas them there, the individual sitting there in the suit on the, on, on, on the left. As I say, we get these shadowy pictures that survive of what's going on in, in those three camps. Here's the Treblinka railway station. Um, as I said, they even built a fake um, schedule of a par uh, departing and arriving trains from different points in Europe to give the impression for victims arriving that, that they're um, arriving at some kind of destination um, other than a death camp. Sobibor was um, made to look like a farming community. Here again, you have photographs out of one of the camps. Um, it's not only Jews that are being sent to there, Poles are as well, uh, Roma, um, gypsy peoples uh, as well. Here you can see uh, the Roma gathered up and, and at one point they're all exterminated in these camps as, as, as well. And um, basically the killing staff are, are um, you know, are drunk and demoralized. They're waiting in death, essentially. Um, here's a Christmas card that uh, survived, sent from one of the uh, death camps by a guard. Um, the inscription reads, um, this war has not dampened our good spirits. Um, this says it all. This paradise and you see this paradise at the bottom written with um, uh, hangman gallows and little pictures of rotting corpses are pasted to the the christmas card uh, so again um, hitler himmler's notion and hitler's notion of scientific uh final solution and killing with decency is is, is you know uh, clearly out, out out the window The problem 
in these camps um, is essentially not so much uh, being able to kill the the the, the people, uh, but their ability to dispose of um, the bodies. Um, it's um, very difficult to dispose a human body as many ordinary murders will um, attest to it's it's um, as I say it's, it's 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 not an easy thing um, let alone uh, hundreds of thousands of, 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 of bodies and so as you can see from this illustration eventually they bring in these huge excavators looking at one of the camps uh, where they dig out these uh, huge mass graves with uh, excavators and um, dump, again, hundreds of thousands of bodies into these graves. Now, the problem is, of course, is um, bodies will swell up uh, uh, with, with, as, as they decay with gas and and then eventually as the flesh begins to uh, rot and um, come apart these gaseous bodies uh, burst like a balloon um, and and um, if you bury uh, about say 5,000 or 6,000 people that you've killed almost relatively at the same time, um, you have four or 5,000 bodies all bloating up and then uh, all more or less bursting at the same time. And, and so as these bodies like balloons burst in their graves, um, of course, the graves now begin to collapse. Um, and, and various rotting body parts begin to come through the surface. And um, as the Germans are facing uh, now the Russian army that is beginning to um, approach towards these camps, they suddenly realize that these mass graves are, are, are being exposed. And so um, a special Zonderkommando 1005 is formed to now dig up hundreds of thousands, actually over a million bodies that they had uh, buried in all those Einsatzgruppen shootings and at um, the Reinhardt camps. Um, and Zonderkommando 1005 now travels with maps of these former killing sites and grave sites, digs up the bodies and, and attempts to burn them now in this kind of systemized way that they have uh, developed essentially um, layering the bodies so that, um, you know, what remains of kind of um, fat and, and grease in the body that has not yet decayed fuels the fire. And even that is not successful, as you can see in this series of photographs uh, from the Zonderkommando 1005 commander shows that after the cremation um, at the bottom right, you can see a body has still partly survived. And so all these graves have to be, as I say, repacked uh, and, and, and burnt. They also bring in um, bone grinders that will uh, grind into dust whatever remaining bones are, are, are discovered to further um, cover up the, the murders committed in these camps. Here he is, uh, Bieberstein, or he's, uh, sorry, Blobel is the name of um, the, the commander. Um, Paul Blobel is a former architect. He was one of those um, Einsatzgruppen commanders who is given the assignment of digging up these bodies, which he does for about um, 18 months. He travels um, throughout uh, Eastern Europe digging up bodies, and usually uh, the Sonderkommando 1005 
um, the members. He recruits uh, people locally and then he shoots them after the operation and then recruits other peoples in different locations to maintain secrecy. Uh, eventually, Blobel goes uh, mad. Having um, been doing this work for 18 months, he um, kind of vanishes and U.S. Army uh, kind of finds him hiding in a cave somewhere, living like a, a hermit when he's um, finally arrested. And Blobel will stand trial. Um, although he's not charged necessarily with the disposal of the bodies, he's charged with the crimes he had committed when uh, he was uh, a uh, Einsatz uh, group and commander. So Belzec, Sobibor, uh, Treblinka, uh, as the Russians are beginning to approach in, uh, towards 19. Um, 43, 44, um, these camps are, are, are going to be then blown up completely and leveled. Um, the uh, Ukrainian guards will be settled onto um, the land where the camps were, and um, they will farm that land further. Uh, covering up the former existence of those camps. So very little, in fact, no uh, trace of those camps remains today. There, there are monuments there, uh, but, um, you know, there may be some foundations left, uh, but there were already kind of improvised camps. And, and, and so essentially they were raised to the ground, uh, leaving um, virtually no trace of their locations, although certainly archaeological expeditions have, have worked on um, those locations, trying to identify various um, layouts of, of, of these camps. The property of the victims is systematically seized. Um, gold teeth are pulled from uh, victims' mouths and the gold melted down into bars, their wedding rings, um, all their personal property, and it's redistributed. Uh, things like eyeglasses, uh, clothing, everything taken from the people they're killing is redistributed into the German economy. Um, but gold and currency, oh, oh, in here you can actually see some of the catalogs that uh, the Nazis uh, produced, va you know, listing all the items they've they, they've they've captured. You know, uh, gentlemen's wristwatches, gold brooches with brilliance, uh, seven thousand fountain pens. This is from one uh, shipment. Uh, revolving pencils, shaving equipment, um, alarm clocks, briefcases. Um, this one, uh, this particular report, 27th of February 1948, reports. Uh, 100 million Reichsmarks worth of uh, property. So we're uh, talking about approximately 25 million US dollars at, at, at that uh, time. Um, the overall uh, financial take was approximately 45 million dollars in uh, U.S. dollars. Um, Walter Funk, the president of the Reichsbank, will make a deal with Heydrich to handle all the, the gold that is pulled, again, from uh, people's mouths, from uh, dental implants, and, and, and so forth. And Walter Funk will be one of the defendants at Nuremberg as well. And remarkably, Walter Funk um, will be given a life sentence and then released uh, in the 1950s because of ill health. The money is then uh, the gold. The bars are then exfiltrated out of Germany 
um, into a bank in Switzerland, the Bank of Internet, a Bank for International Settlements, the BIS. Uh, you're looking at the board of directors of this bank. Uh, this is the 16th of June, 1943. Uh, and there's Walter Funk. He's on the board of directors of the Swiss bank, along with uh, Dr. Hermann Schmitz, who's the head of IG Farben, the corporation that um, is involved in building Auschwitz, uh, the fourth largest corporation in the world after uh, three American corporations, General Motors, uh, U.S. Steel, and Standard Oil of New Jersey. IG Farben was the fourth largest world corpor corporation. Uh, Emil Pohl is um, the deputy president of the Reichsbank. And, and there's uh, Kurt von Schroeder. You may remember I mentioned Kurt von Schroeder in my earlier lectures as being um, a banker who is close to Poppins' faction in the Catholic Army, and it's uh, in Schroeder's apartment that the first meetings between Poppin and Hitler occur in January of 1933 before their move to Rippentrop's apartment. Kurt von Schroeder is also on the board of directors of this bank in, 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 in Zurich. Um, the rest of the members of the board of directors are our um, allies, like Azzolini from Rome, uh, or their people from occupied territories, like Boisinger of Paris is a Vichy, uh, a France functionary. Um, Alexander Galopin from Belgium, Brussels, is a collaborator of the Nazis. Belgium is under Nazi control. Um, you can see there's someone there from Japan as, as, as well. So essentially, the board of directors are controlled by uh, the Nazis. In fact, Alexander Galopin is going to be assassinated by the Belgian resistance. Uh, one person from a neutral country, Ivar Ruth of Sweden. Um, however, of course, Sweden is selling metal ore to the Nazis. In fact, Sweden is profiting enormously from the war and is basically pro-Nazi, um, you know, even though they remain officially neutral. And then on this board, uh, you have two British officials from the Bank of England, Sir Otto Niemeyer and Montague Collett Norman, who is the, the chairman of the Bank of England. Uh, the BIS is, as I say, a central bank representing world's central banks. In other words, the Bank of Canada's bank is the BIS. Uh, the Bank of England's bank, the Federal Reserve's international bank, the, U the U.S. don't have a central bank, but they do have a Federal Reserve. The BIS is their bank. It's um, the world's central bank's banker. And, and, and so this, again, is why nobody invades Switzerland is because all the bankers from around the world can meet during the war uh, and and continue doing business, uh, including business in moving around uh, gold that is yanked out of uh, Jewish victims' mouths um, in, 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 in the Holocaust. Um, the BIS still remains in business today. Uh, still going strong. It still has the same function. It's, uh, like I say, uh, the Bank of Canada banks with the BIS. You can explore their website on bis.org. Uh, it presents itself, as you can read from its, its website. I think they've updated this now, but um, it still essentially says the same thing. The BIS is an international organization which fosters cooperations among central banks and other agencies in pursuit of monetary and financial stability. Its banking services are provided exclusively to central banks and international organizations. 
So um, that's essentially the path that all these Holocaust assets uh, take. And, and here you can see the actual affidavit of Oswald Pohl, who um, worked for the bank, and he describes how his office with the Reichsbank president, Walter Funk, and the Reichsbank um, managed in regards to jewelry, rings, gold teeth, foreign exchange, and other articles of value from the possessions of people, particularly Jews, who had been killed in the concentration camp. This is from, again, the Nuremberg documents. And in, in, in fact, um, they go to dinner at one point, according to this affidavit. Uh, and, and after dinner, uh, they're invited for an inspection of the Reichsbank's vaults. And uh, they're shown uh, gold bars and other valuable possessions of the Reichsbank. I remember exactly that various trunks of objects from concentration camps were opened. These camps kill an extraordinary amount of uh, people. Um, Treblinka, approximately 800,000 people killed in Treblinka. Uh, and um, only about 40 survive. Uh, Many of the survivors um, are actually Russian POWs who revolt and escape from uh, Treblinka. Uh, in fact, there's a revolt in, in Sobibor and Treblinka of, of Russian POWs. So um, th those camps are also killing, as I say, Russian um, prisoners of war. Um, Sobibor, uh, 250,000 killed, um, 600 prisoners escape from that revolt of POWs in uh, Sobibor, uh, only 50 survive. Belzec, uh, 600,000 people murdered. Uh, and as far as we know, there are only two confirmed survivors of uh, Belzec. Um, one, escapes during the, the war. Um, uh, another escapes when the camp is evacuated. Uh, but um, one of the survivors returns to Poland in 1946 to testify uh, about what happened in the camps and he's murdered by anti-Semitic Poles upon his return to uh, Poland. So, so in fact, we only had one survivor out of uh, Belzec. The, um, the Ukrainian guards, as I say, are, 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 are left behind. Uh, they're, they're set up as farmers on the former campgrounds. And um, as the Russians approach, they eventually uh, begin to escape in various directions. Uh, some of them arrive um, under various false identities in Canada, in the United States. Like I said, Demanyuk, for example, was captured in uh, Detroit. Um, the T4 staff are redeployed now. They're redeployed to Ozak, uh, the operational zone on uh, the Adriatic shore. Uh, in this region that is contested between Italy and Yugoslavia, uh, Gorizia, Udine, Trieste, they're actually based in Trieste. Um, they're there, they're known as Einsatz uh, Commando R. Uh, there uh, will be headquartered in 
uh, the suburb of San Saba outside of Trieste in uh, the Riziera, the rice factory. Uh, they convert this rice factory into kind of an extermination center. You're, you're looking at kind of the shadow of um, the gas, oh, sorry, of a crematorium that they had built there. They install torture chambers in this rice factory. Um, and again, it's a Holocaust memorial site there. And there um, now, uh, Christian Reef and the former staff of T4 proceed uh, to kill um, Italian Jews, uh, resistance fighters, any uh, Jews in the region of Yugoslavia around uh, Trieste, and ostensibly uh, they're fighting um, Italian and uh, Yugoslavian partisans, guerrillas. Uh, Court France is deployed there. You can see him in Trieste uh, with palm trees. Um, here, Court France and many of his staff are now decorated. Um, the, the Nazis did not give iron crosses and um, military decorations for killing Jews. Uh, and, and, and so now they get their medals uh, essentially for killing partisans or, or killing guerrillas. Here's Hockenholt. Uh, Lawrence Hockenholt gets now an Iron Cross finally uh, in Italy. There he is. He gets also a potted plant with his Iron Cross and, and a shake of, of a hand. Uh, Hockenholt will disappear at the end of the war. Uh, he's officially declared dead uh, by the German government, but um, there's no evidence that he actually uh, died. We don't know under what, if he did die, under what circumstances. There is a strange phenomenon occurring among Einstein's group in our, there uh, Einsatz Commando are. There's a very high rate of casualties uh, when you compare them to other um, other anti-partisan guerrilla groups. It was a very dangerous combat assignment, but somehow um, these guys are being thrown into the most dangerous encounters with uh, guerrilla fighters outside of uh, Trieste as if somebody is trying to kill them off. And, and, and so again, one of the uh, speculations is, is uh, that um, Himmler, indeed, the way Bach Zalewski warned him, said, you know, these men are finished. How are all, all my uh, soldiers ever going to be able to return to Germany as normal men? Well, they're not going to be able to return. It appears like Himmler now is hoping that they all get killed off rather than bringing them back to Germany. Uh, certainly these are not his decent killers. Um, these are um, individuals who had gone amok, um, went on these sadistic orgies during Operation Reinhardt um, and um, continue in Northern Italy committing these uh, sadistic murders and slowly appeared to, uh, as I say, being deployed in this um, in these killing operations. Eventually, we come to uh, the savage Christian Christian Reef. Uh, late in 1944, um, several high-ranking officers arrive from SS headquarters in Berlin, and they asked Christian Reef to give them a tour of the various defensive positions around Trieste, and they drive off with him. Uh, they come back in the evening uh, with his body on the back seat of their car. Uh, according to 
their story is uh, that Yugoslav partisans had ambushed them. Um, they all survived, but Christian Reef was uh, heroically killed in th this partisan attack. And, and so there's a military uh, funeral and um, he remains buried in a German military uh, cemetery in northern Italy on uh, Lago di Garda in, in central Italy. So it's a possibility that, um, again, that, you know, we don't know one way or the other, but it's a, it's a possibility that um, he was just killed off by uh, Himmler because, again, of um, the kind of hardcore killing role that this T4 staff played starting from 1939 all the way to 1944, you know, we're, we're, we're talking, uh, you know, five years of killing essentially. So the, the, these are the hard core genocidal um, mass murderers, you know, state serial killers and indeed, um, you know, they fall way beyond the kind of parameters of uh, killing with decency that Himmler was um, calling for. Himmler is going to make this speech to his SS officers in 1943. Um, I'll read you most of it. He says, I also want to mention a very difficult subject before of you here, completely openly. It should be discussed amongst us, and yet, nevertheless, we will never speak about it in public. Just as we did not hesitate on June 30th to carry out our duty as ordered and stand comrades who had fallen, who had failed, against the wall and shoot them. And of course, he's referring to um, the purge of the brown shirts, the killing of Ernst Rome, um, about which we have never spoken and never will speak. That was, thank God, a kind of tact natural to us, a foregone conclusion of that tact that we have never conversed about it um, amongst ourselves, never spoken about it. Everyone shuddered and everyone was clear that the next time he would do the same thing again, if it were commanded and necessary. I'm talking about the Jewish evacuation, the extermination of the Jewish people. It is one of those things that is easily said. The Jewish people is being exterminated, every party member will tell you perfectly clear. It's part of our plans. We're eliminating the Jews, exterminating them. Ah, small matter. And then along they all come, all the 80 million upright Germans, and each one of them has his decent Jew. They say, all the other Jews are swine, but here is a first-class Jew. And none of them has seen it, has endured it. Most of you know what it means when 100 corpses lie together in a row, when there are 500, or when there are a thousand. To have seen this through, and with the exception of human weakness, to have remained decent has made us hard and is a page of glory never mentioned and never to be mentioned. I will never see it happen that even one bit of putrefaction comes in contact with us or takes root in us. In us. On the contrary, where it might try to take root, we will burn it out together. And all together we can say we have carried out this most difficult task for the love of our people. And we have taken on no defect within us, in our soul or in our character. And so as he's making this speech, 
1943, he in fact has at that moment Max Taubner's court-martial conviction and is trying to decide whether he's going to commute his sentence or or or, or see it through. But essentially, um, what Himmler is lamenting here is the various failures of being able to kill um, all these victims with with what he calls decency. And now um, the Nazis are, are, are going to finally find a way to eliminate this 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 problem uh, and and it's it's going to be with the way um, they're going to operate now Auschwitz which is we can describe this as, as a kind of a third generation uh, camp here finally the Nazis will perfect the system of genocide and and perfect how to kill without traumatizing um, the killers and and so we'll look at that in another lecture as we look at the operation of um, the Auschwitz uh, concentration camp <laughs>